Well, good evening. It is a delight to be with you once again, and I want to turn your attention this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to continue with Paul's argument and what it means to embrace the foolishness. This morning, we looked at embracing the foolish message, and this evening, we're going to look at embracing a foolish method. Have you ever had this thought? My church would be boring if I invited a friend. I mean, if I really invited my friends and my neighbors, my coworkers to come and, and listen to a 53-minute monologue from an old book, what are they going to think? I mean, couldn't we do something with the glorious message of Jesus Christ that could actually win a hearing for that message? Couldn't we package this message in something other than just this preaching thing. I mean, maybe you've thought that my poor church, they just haven't learned the psychology of the hearer. They just don't understand what it takes for people to make a decision, uh, to make a fundamental change in their worldview. Uh, They've never gone to a class on basic salesmanship. They've never learned the art of rhetoric. They've never learned the art of persuasion. Surely there was some class in seminary that my pastor skipped where he could have just learned what would it take to get people to be moved to make a decision, to change their lives, to follow Christ, to to do whatever it is the, the preacher or the teacher would want them to do. Surely there's some training, some seminar somewhere that we could get to employ the age-old tricks of rhetoric. Well, I want to let you behind the scenes this evening a little bit and, and sort of explain to you a little bit about the conviction that undergirds your pastor's ministry. Why does Tom do what he does every week? Stand up and open God's Word and explain it verse by verse by verse book by book. You need to understand that this is not uh, merely an oversight as if pastors of faithful churches have merely neglected some art form of persuasion, but it is actually born out of a deep-rooted conviction in where the power of God is for the transformation of life, that it is not merely in the human ability to persuade but is rooted absolutely and totally in a clear proclamation of the Word of God. The Word of God is where the power is. The gospel is where the power is, and not in some person's ability to persuade. So, you need to understand why Grace Life London and other faithful churches are so committed to what seems to be perhaps an outmoded form of persuasion bare, unadorned proclamation of God's Word, expository preaching. And the bottom line, the answer is, that is where the power is. Your pastor is committed to verse-by-verse exposition, seeking clarity in explaining God's Word, because that alone is the place for the powerful transformation of life. The Apostle Paul embraced the foolish message of the gospel. We looked at that this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This evening, what I want you to see is he embraced also the foolish message of bare proclamation of the gospel, bare proclamation of the message of God. The Apostle Paul not only embraced the foolishness of a crucified Messiah, a blasphemous scandal to Jews, a puny God to the Romans, an unsophisticated philosophy to the Greeks, But Paul also embraced the foolishness of the way he was supposed to deliver that message, unadorned proclamation. You see, clear declaration of God's truth, not dressed up in the packaging that the world most adored, not made attractive to the world's tastes, not delivered in a manner to win the applause of unbelievers, but clear, unadulterated, unadorned proclamation of the message. And if you remember back from this morning, 1 Corinthians 1.17 gives us the heading for both a foolish message and a foolish method. Paul says, Christ sent me to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 
not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Do you understand what he's saying? If I proclaim the gospel packaged in cleverness of speech that's going to tickle your ears and make you entertained by the way I say it, then it actually makes void the power of the gospel itself, and I will not do it. I think sometimes people misunderstand Paul the way many preachers have been misunderstood through church history. People misunderstand Paul by thinking, well, he just wasn't schooled in rhetoric. If he were, he would have been much more impressive. Paul was not impressive to the Corinthians, but it wasn't for a lack of education. It wasn't for a lack of understanding. In fact, we're going to see in this chapter that Paul knew all the tricks of Greco-Roman rhetoric and refused to use them. Because if he had used them to persuade his hearers, they would have been persuaded not by the gospel, but by his eloquence. And so Paul ran away from that very thing. If you want to buy, if you want people to buy Jinsu knives, do you have infomercials? Is that a thing here? No? <laughs> people spend a lot of times. A lot of time on television in America selling things, selling knives, selling as-seen-on-TV products. And if you listen to their speeches, they all sound the same. They want to pull on your emotions. They want to give you compelling arguments so that by the end of it, you yield not only your will but your dollars. And if you want to sell knives on such an advertisement, then the power might be in your ability to use words to persuade. But if you want people to believe the gospel, the power is not in your words. The power is in the gospel itself. Let's read together 1 Corinthians chapter 2, our text for this evening. And then we're going to step back and look at some of the background at Corinth. Paul says, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom, a wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory." But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, which has not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Will you pray with me? O God, we come again to your word, and we are creatures, and we are totally dependent upon you for every breath that we take. We walk on your earth, we breathe your air, we are sustained by your very power, and we so desperately need your word. We need to think your thoughts after you. Our thoughts come from below, and your thoughts are the truths that last forever. 
We could even say with the psalmist, I have more knowledge, I am wiser than all of my teachers because I love your law. Would that be true of us, O God, that we might know your word so well and so thoroughly as to transcend the wisdom and so-called knowledge of this world? Lord, we long to think your thoughts after you, to see the world as you do, so that we might live faithfully before you. We pray, O God, this evening that you would use your word by the power of your spirit to this end, that we might honor you by submitting to your word and your ways that you might accomplish your works. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If we are to understand Paul's meaning here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we need to spend a little bit of time understanding the Corinthian situation. And, and we might discover what the Corinthian problem what actually was that Paul is addressing. Why does Paul exert so much effort, four chapters, in defense of his own mode of preaching, his own method of, of displaying God's truth? And why does he begin his letter in this way? And to understand that, we need to spend a little time, maybe a little more time than usual, in getting to know the backdrop of 1 Corinthians, to take a little more time digging into the cultural background, since it is critical to understanding Paul's meaning. I believe that there's no fuller treatment anywhere in Scripture of what preaching must be. And I believe what we will discover this evening has far-reaching implications for pastors. It has far-reaching implications for churches, for missionaries, for parents, for students, uh, for every Christian in this room. And it even has far-reaching implications for any of you here who do not yet know Christ. So to get it right, let's dig a little more deeply than usual, perhaps, into the cultural, historical setting of this part of our Bible. I want to dig a little bit into the backdrop of what is called Greco-Roman rhetoric. Uh, now, my kids in their school study rhetoric. I don't know if you studied rhetoric or the art forms of public persuasion. Uh, politicians study these things. Advertisers study these things. All of the people who give TED Talks have studied these things. But you need to understand the importance that these principles played at Corinth in particular and in the ancient world. Greco-Roman rhetoric has been defined as the art of persuasion. Cicero called it that. Uh, one of the artisans of this form of speaking called it the study of the discursive techniques allowing us to induce or increase the mind's adherence to those presented for its assent. It is the art of finding and employing the most effective means of persuasion on any subject. So the goal of rhetoric was to convince people to move from the opinion they held to hold another opinion. The era of Greco-Roman rhetoric were the couple of centuries leading up to the New Testament and a couple of centuries after the New Testament. So the New Testament is right in the middle of the climactic heyday of the art form called rhetoric. And the teachers of rhetoric were names you may have heard of, Aristotle, Cicero, Quintilian, and Socrates. They have given descriptions of Greco-Roman rhetoric. Plato called it the art that leads the soul by means of words. Socrates called it the, the producer of persuasion. Cicero called it the ability to influence the minds of the hearers and to turn them in whatever direction the case demands. The goal of Greco-Roman rhetoric was persuasion. Persuasion. And the word used for persuasion oftentimes was the New Testament word for faith. The rhetorician, the orator, the speaker wanted you to place your faith in what he was saying. And that faith came with a yielded response. And that yielded response was successful to the degree that the orator used his ingenuity in employing very specific rhetorical strategies. The effectiveness in the persuader was measured by the degree to which his audience yielded to the rhetorical effect. So you were only successful if the audience was moved by what you said. There were five primary tools of Greco-Roman rhetoric, according to Quintilian, invention, some sort of creativity, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Greco-Roman rhetoric had no place for a man who would stand up in front of people and read from notes. 
that you were skilled if you created this wonderful speech, put it together in just the perfect arrangement, memorized it, and then delivered it flawlessly. That's what made you a good orator. And they were working on really three aspects in the psyche of the listener, the logos, the pathos, and the ethos. That is, the mind, the emotion, and the will. Cicero listed these three functions of oratory to instruct, to delight, and to move. He said that orator is duty-bound to instruct. You have to give information. Giving pleasure to the listeners is a free gift to the audience, and to move them is indispensable. You were after the mind, you were after the motions, and you were after the will. They sought to understand the psychology of the hearer. They wanted to know what will persuade, and so they studied their audience. They wanted to know what kinds of keys do I need to use in my speaking to get my audience to believe me, than to be entertained by me so that at just the right moments, I can move them the direction I want them to go. There was ingenuity in using these tools available and with the audience at hand to accomplish the desired result. It really was an art form. The speaker needed to establish credibility. And so, setting forth the right kinds of facts would give him credibility for the audience. Then the audience could sort of give themselves over to the orator to be moved about and entertained by the movement of the will so that the emotions could be teased so that at just the right moment, the orator could seal the deal and get the audience to yield to his persuasion to instruct, to entertain, to please, all with the right organization and all with the right timing, to get to this emotional apex, to get a decision. And today's infomercials are based on these principles. Political speeches are grounded in these tools, the motivational talks and the TED talks of our day, all employ these strategies. In fact, if you listen to them, you can sort of hear the basic structure of, let me give you some facts to establish my credibility. Then let me tease you out with a well-timed tearjerker story or some humorous illustration or some autobiographical point. And then, then I have you right where I want you so I can move your will to make some choice in life, to move you to my cause or to get you to buy my product. These are well-tried Time tried tools. The power of Greco Roman rhetoric is stated this way Plato said, It is the art that leads the soul by means of words. Gorgias said, It is the ability to persuade with speeches. Cicero called it the ability to influence the minds of the hearers and turn them in whatever way I want. He says, there is to my mind no more exceeding thing than the power by means of oratory to get a hold on assemblies of men, to win their goodwill, to direct their inclinations wherever I wish. He says, this eloquence has the power to sway men's minds and move them in every possible way. Now it storms the feelings. Now it creeps in. It implants new ideas and it uproots the old. Cicero quoted an old excellent poet that he believed had the eloquence of soul-bending sovereignty over all things. He said, when one hears a real orator, he believes what is said, thinks it true, assents, and then approves the orator's words with conviction. The listening throng is delighted, is carried along by his words, in a sense bathed deep in delight. They feel now joy, now sorrow. They're moved now to laughter, now to tears. They show approbation, detestation, scorn, aversion. They are drawn to pity and to shame, to regret. They are stirred to anger, to wonder, to hope and fear. And all these come to pass just as the hearer's minds are played upon by the orator's word and thought and action. Quintilian said of Cicero, he was born by the favor of God to be the man in whom eloquence could try out all her powers. Who can give information more precisely or stir the feelings more deeply? Who ever had such gift of charm? You believe him to be winning by consent what he is really extorting by force. 
And when he sweeps the judge along with his violence, the judge feels not that he's being hijacked, but he is going along of his own accord. Indeed, such is the authority in everything Cicero says that one is ashamed to disagree. Do you feel the power wrapped up in skilled oration? And the value here for the orators for Greek philosophy was that the word was better than the sword. And there's something to that, right? If we're going to fight battles, if I'm going to convince people to go the direction I want them to go, far better if I convince them with a speech than with an army. I could threaten people with a sword to bend them to my will, or I could appeal to them with the beauty and eloquence of persuasive speech, and then we can all go together. And you'll feel like you wanted to even though I'm getting you to do exactly what I wanted you to do. The reach of Greco-Roman rhetoric was far-reaching. It, it spread through the whole culture. Not everybody in the Greek and Roman world was an orator, but everyone was a critic of oratory. Right? This was the time before television and movies and Facebook. What did you do to be entertained? You went and listened to people speak. And orators were prized entertainers. They were also the professionals. They, they were the ones who got jobs as uh, advocates in court. They got jobs selling things. And they got jobs entertaining. These were the professional orators. But everybody else sort of played fantasy rhetoric. The esteem of eloquence was just part of the culture. In fact, it was the pride of Greek culture. Someone who spoke poorly or lowly or didn't use these tools, didn't spend 20 years of his life studying the art forms of rhetoric, was looked down upon. And everybody was a critic. Skilled orators were highly esteemed. It took years of training combined with natural talents and an impressive physical presence to be successful. They were prized as advocates and lawyers. They were successful as politicians. Careers were to be made in teaching rhetoric. Many people plied their skills simply for the entertainment of the masses. It didn't matter if what you said was true. People would pay to listen to you speak just to be pulled along by your words to some new view. It didn't matter if it was right or wrong. They were the entertainers. In a world where upward movement was very difficult, rhetoric provided an opportunity where people of any class could make a fortune. Just spend the next 25 years of your life studying the art form, and if you're good enough, if you're beautiful enough, if you're impressive enough, you just might have a ticket to wealth and power. Now, we need to understand something about the audience and the audience's relationship to rhetoric. You have to understand that, that the speaker and the audience had sort of made a deal. The audience truly was sovereign. The orator is playing the audience, but the audience is paying for this experience. And so the audience, all the while they're listening to you and being played by you, the orator, the audience is judging whether or not the orator has played them well enough for the audience to yield. We judge songs and plays and movies this way. I want to be moved. I'm paying good money and I want you to use all of your skills, all of your technology, all of your artistry to affect me. And if you're not good at it, uh, rotten tomatoes are your reward. Now, there were two major types of public speakers in the ancient world. One was the persuader. That was the lawyer, the politician, the philosopher, the entertainer. He was expected to use all of the tools of rhetoric to accomplish his goals with a given audience, and he was successful only when the audience yielded. But there was another kind of public speaker in the ancient world, and he was called the herald. That is, one who represented some dignitary, and his job was to convey that dignitary's message. He was expected simply, clearly, accurately to convey the message given to him. And he was deemed successful only if he faithfully carried out his commission to clearly communicate his master's message. Now, in the art of rhetoric, the constant that you were always looking for was the audience's response. That was what you were always aiming to get. The variables were content and form. Form. 
Say whatever you want to say. Package it however you want to package it. In fact, you're trying to figure out what to say and how to say it in conjunction with the audience because you're always trying to figure out what's going to get them to move to my opinion. That's rhetoric. But the herald... For the herald, the the constant was always content and form. I must say what my master has sent me to say, and I must say it the way he has told me to say it. It's not up to me to fiddle with the message. It's not up to me to change the form and the packaging of the message. The variable for the herald is the audience's response. The herald was deemed successful if and only if he faithfully conveyed the message given to him. Now, this is a remarkable way to think about what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You see, the persuader was goals-driven, but the herald was obedience-driven. And Corinth was a city that was enamored with the art of rhetoric. Paul was a man enamored with the glory of God. He was going to be a herald, and he was going to be obedience-driven rather than goals-driven in his approach to the proclamation of God's truth. Paul was a herald, and this is evident even in the vocabulary that he employs to describe his own ministry. You have the vocabulary of the persuasive orator, words that come over from uh, from Greek into English that, that give us words like art and craft, persuasion, excellence, and the virtue of proficiency, the, the word for eloquence. Uh, the word demonstration is important in rhetoric. It was the demonstration of the orator's power and prowess. Sophist or wisdom was important, and, and of course the word power was employed. And they spoke not of the power of the message, but the power of the messenger to get the audience to yield to whatever message was proclaimed. But the vocabulary Paul used to describe his own preaching were words you're familiar with. Evangelism, uh, that is the proclamation of good news. That's a heralding word. Uh, Keruso or or preaching, it is the, the, the verb for preaching and heralding God's message. Other words used to describe his message were that of announcing or reporting. Or even the word for martyr, I give testimony. It was the word used in a court of law for those who were brought in not to persuade the judge, but to give testimony to the facts of a case. That's the way Paul viewed his own preaching. Now, Corinth was a famous hub of Greco-Roman rhetoric. In fact, Quintilian, whom I've quoted a number of times already this evening, was a citizen at Corinth and a contemporary of the Apostle Paul. Do you understand why this was important for Paul's audience and even why he's writing this letter this way? The Corinthians had their hometown hero in Quintilian for which the city of Corinth was world famous as a hub of the art form of persuasive speech. And so the Corinthians must have been scratching their head at the Apostle Paul who didn't use the vocabulary of the orator. It's evident that he knew the vocabulary of the orator. In fact, Paul had been schooled and skilled in the art forms of persuasive speech. It's obvious in the things he's written in the New Testament. But he intentionally did not use those tricks, and particularly at Corinth, because as we saw this morning, those things which God is out to destroy are the things which humans prize, human wisdom, human power, human influence. The real problem of applying Greco-Roman rhetoric to preaching was not just because it was unethical. Some orators were more ethical than others. Some didn't care about truth. They just wanted to persuade the audience, and they would tell lies to win the audience. But there were some who valued truth as virtuous and would never tell something that was untrue. But still their goal was to use whichever truth they could to persuade an audience. The problem is not that it was necessarily unethical. The problem with rhetoric is that it was so natural. In other words, it it was just so much about what man can do. So much about man's abilities, man's art forms, man's techniques. It placed the power of persuasion into the hands of men and, and put it on the lips of men and put it in the mind of man. 
rather than resting in the power for real transformed lives in the Word of God, wielded by the Spirit of God in the hearts of the people of God. The problem with Greco-Roman rhetoric is that it allowed the audience to remain sovereign. Right? If a preacher of the gospel is going to spend his time thinking, I need to think about these people and what would tug on their heartstrings in order to get them into the gospel. And what techniques can I use to get them from where they are to where they need to be? Then the preacher will compromise on content and form. And he must not do that. What if an unbeliever, persuaded by techniques, or impressed or entertained by our programming, or our buildings, or our music, what if he was persuaded to come to Christ without ever being saved. What an eternal tragedy that would be. And yet people are convinced every day of all kinds of things that aren't true. It's possible to be persuaded of the truth and never be born again. And so Paul ran away from these techniques on purpose. All of that was introduction to this evening's message in 1 Corinthians 2. Here's the main point. The Apostle Paul embraced the foolishness of the message he proclaimed and the method by which he proclaimed it. I'm going to give you this evening four commitments that undergirded Paul's preaching from this chapter. Four commitments that undergirded his preaching. And these same four commitments undergird Tom's preaching here week in and week out. And by the way, what a privilege it is to stand where your pastor normally does and open God's Word. You need to know that this church is prayed for around the world. That you are prayed for by many who know of this light in this city. And it is a tremendous privilege to stand here and open God's Word to you. The first commitment that undergirded Paul's preaching is that Paul resisted the persuasive techniques that the Corinthians esteemed. He resisted those techniques that the Corinthians loved. We see this in the first five verses. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. To be a respected orator, you had to have an impressive physical appearance. To have smooth skin and tall stature was important. To have a booming voice was essential. And Paul didn't have these things. And he resisted the techniques that went along with the appearances. Notice Paul's vocabulary as he describes how he did and did not speak among the Corinthians, proclaiming Verse 1, there's one of those herald words, he proclaimed. And he had a message to proclaim, and he did not come with superiority of speech, but he came preaching. And notice he says in verse 2, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. That's the, the verbal witness of a martyr, a testimony, a, a, a one who was there and saw and can give verbal testimony to facts. And Paul resisted superiority of speech and superiority of wisdom. He didn't use all the rhetorical flourishes of the experts and the entertainers of his day. And notice in verse 2, he made a determination this was a conscious commitment. Again, this wasn't neglect on Paul's part. He purposed to know nothing except Jesus the Christ and Him crucified. Again, back to that foolish message we looked at this morning. The message that would be laughed at, seen as unsophisticated and weak or even a scandal and a stumbling block. Now listen, Paul's not a know-nothing it's evident that he knows the vocabulary of Greco-Roman rhetoric. It's all over this chapter. It's evident that Paul has been schooled theologically. He knows the Old Testament Scriptures. He spent most of his life studying. He's no ignoramus. 
In fact, he is enjoining on them wisdom in verse 6 and a wisdom that transcends our time. He is giving them God's very wisdom in verse 7, mysteries of God from before the foundation of the world and things that God uh, has that man himself by his own resources can't access, verses 8 and 9. He's going to give them the depths of God by divine revelation in verse 10. And he's going to tell us in verses 11 and 12 that he actually knows the thoughts of God. So when he says, I've determined to know nothing, (laughs) he's not saying, I'm going to be ignorant for ignorance's sake. He is clear in this letter that he believes a great deal more than simply the crucifixion of Jesus. He's not saying, I'm only going to stand in front of you and say, Jesus died to pay for sins. Jesus died to pay for sins. That is not what he means here in verse 2. When he says, I have determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, this is a contrast to the orators of the day. Paul determined not to couch the message of Christ in the language of the orator. Uh, Not to give it all of the the trappings, all of the attractive features that would make people want to be persuaded to the message because in fact they were persuaded by the trappings. He's only going to give them the message. Bear proclamation of the truth. Rather than what the Corinthians would have considered powerful, persuasive, rhetorical skill, Paul determined to know none of that. He says in verse 3, I came to you in weakness and fear in much trembling. And scholars have debated, what does Paul mean by this? Was this a reference to his physical ailments? Those physical ailments which rendered him unimpressive to a group of people who were groomed to be critics of public speakers. I mean, can you imagine preaching in front of the Corinthians? You stand up and they get out their notebooks and they're going to grade you. (laughs) Paul was unimpressive. Did, Did he tremble because of these things? Maybe Paul knew that he did not have the look or the sound that they were looking for. Your job is to share the gospel with a bunch of rowdy football players, and you know they won't listen to a small-armed captain of the chess club. I don't fit in with these people. I'm not impressive to them in what they're looking for, and so they won't listen to me. Think about Paul's travels leading up to his first time in Corinth. This is recorded for us in Acts 16 and 17. He was jailed in Philippi. In Thessalonica, he was forced to escape by night. In Berea, the next town he had to escape. In Athens, he was provoked by all the idolatries there. He was alone. He was uh, preaching there with mixed results. Some listened, but others wanted him run out of town. And, And all of those lead him into the city of Corinth in Acts 18. And, and he's alone, isolated, provoked. He's had to escape. He's been on the run. He's been in jail. What is it going to be like for him to preach in this new city? Perhaps this weakness, fear, and trembling is the way that Paul saw himself before God. His statement here would be a reflection of his holy fear of the Lord, his utter dependence upon God for strength, and the free admission of his own intrinsic inability to achieve eternal results. Whatever the reasons for Paul's weakness and fear before the Corinthian believers, The Corinthian culture was not impressed with him. This was not what they looked for in a public speaker. It was not the self-assured, polished, lofty, sweeping, powerful oratory that they appreciated. Verse 4a, he says, My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. Paul's speech was determinedly a different sort than the Corinthians esteemed. They actually considered it contemptible. Perhaps they echoed the sentiments of Quintilian, who was a resident again at Corinth, a contemporary of Paul. He wrote a 12-volume textbook on oratory. The Corinthian people would have been proud of this. And Quintilian said, such speech was bare and meager, weak and devoid of charm. Okay, I'm going to come and speak to these people who love public speaking, and I don't do it the way they want. (laughs) That's a tall order. We read some of Paul's entry in Acts 18, 8 to 11. After reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentiles at the synagogue, they resisted and they blasphemed, and so he turned to others. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. 
And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer. I mean, Jesus had to tell Paul, don't be afraid in Corinth. It gives you just a little bit of a feel of what Paul was anticipating and trying to speak to these people. Don't be afraid. By the way, do any of you get afraid sharing the gospel with someone? I get scared every single time. Here the apostle Paul was scared. And Jesus had to say, Paul, do not be afraid. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. What great confidence. What timely encouragement. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And here's the great news. People at Corinth were actually saved. People actually came to faith in Christ. And this was a demonstration, verse 4, of the spirit and of power. The orators love that word demonstration. But what they were looking for is a demonstration of their own power to persuade somebody to some point of view. What Paul was demonstrating or what was demonstrated by God through Paul was a demonstration of the Spirit's power through the message proclaimed. The message proclaimed. This is real power, demonstration of the Holy Spirit's work. And Paul chose this path so that, verse 5, your faith, Corinthians, would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Listen, what a tragedy it is today, friends, when people are persuaded because of a powerful celebrity persuader. And even people that are persuaded to biblical truth. And then when their hero, their persuader, falls or walks away or lives shamefully, there went the power too. Because all of the power was locked in with that one person's ability to persuade rather than the power of the gospel itself. Paul didn't want any of that. He intentionally ran away from the things the Corinthians would be impressed by. Human persuasion can yield results. It can even bring about the faith that the orators talked about. But a man persuaded and a sinner born again by the Holy Spirit are two radically different things. The Corinthian believers are proof that the unadorned proclamation of the gospel is the power and wisdom of God. And so verse 5 is Paul's purpose statement. I don't think there's any better window in all of Scripture into how Paul viewed his preaching and his ministry than 1 Corinthians 1 to 4. There's no better place for us to look for principles about how to communicate the truth of God as Christians seeking to proclaim Christ to a city or as members of a church praying for their pastor. There's a second commitment that undergirded Paul's preaching, and it is this Paul trusted God's perspective on his message and method. Paul just trusted God. He trusted the, how God looked at these things. And verse 6 is a bit of a transition. You see the yet, yet we do speak wisdom. Up to this point, from 118 all the way down to 25, Paul has been giving us the world's perspective on gospel proclamation. And here we get a turn to God's perspective. And we see this is wisdom among the mature. Sure, they might be blue-collar, unsophisticated, weak, ignoble, the base things in the world's eyes. But the mature in Christ understand where true wisdom and power are found. Not in the ingenuity of man, but in the wisdom of God that transcends this age. Here's God's perspective. Verse 6, the rulers of this age are passing away. All the impressive powers, all the celebrities, all the great people, all the beautiful people, all that impresses us, they are passing away. But God's wisdom, verse 7, is timeless. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages for our glory. That's a remarkable statement. When you engage in bare proclamation of God's truth, you are trusting God for that which he determined to do before time began. And no fad of the first century can beat that. No trend of the 21st century can tackle that. God's wisdom was totally missed by the movers and shakers of the world. Look at verse 8. The wisdom that we proclaim in the gospel 
is the wisdom that none of the rulers of this age even understood. Listen, they think they're the smarty people, but they're not. Uh, You and I have a wisdom that transcends all the smarts of this age. If they were so smart, if they had understood, verse 8, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Think about that. You think you're so smart. You just committed deicide. You just as a culture committed the greatest crime that's ever been per, 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 what is the word I'm looking for? Perpetrated <laughs> in human history. God came in the flesh in the form of a man and you murdered him. And if you were so smart, you would not have done this. And God's wisdom transcends all of this. The, the, the smartest people in the world totally missed this. And this was God's design. Look at verse 9. Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, which have not even entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him. And there Paul appeals to Isaiah 64, 4 to show how countercultural, counterintuitive God's wisdom is in this world. Paul was committed to this. He was committed to trusting God's perspective. A third commitment that undergirded Paul's preaching was that Paul recognized the spiritual nature of God's revelation. God recognized that these weren't just words. These aren't just human activities. This is not merely natural stuff. This is supernatural. Now look at verse 10. For to us, God revealed... For to us, God revealed. And the us there is not all Christians. The us is the apostles, Paul and his associates. Paul here is claiming direct revelation from God. Listen, you you want a wisdom that beats the wisdom of the world, you need to hear directly from the one who made and sustains the world. And that is exactly what Paul is claiming. For to us, verse 10, God revealed these things through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things even the depths of God. And while the Greeks were looking for deep wisdom, God goes deeper. And God revealed the deep things to the writers of the New Testament, to Paul and to his associates. Look at verse 11. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? All Paul is saying right there is, who knows what you're thinking except you? And how would anybody know what you're thinking unless you said it out loud? Only the man knows the thoughts of his own heart. So also, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. And so how is anyone going to know the deep things of God unless God Himself tells us? And my friends, that's what this is. This book is the deep things of God. This is God's own self-disclosure. It's His revelation. And I praise God that we get to read this book. You know there are peoples, language groups all over this world that cannot yet read God's Word in their own language. And Janet and I were uh, walking by that big river you have down here. And uh, we stumbled across a statue of William Tyndale. Like, oh, look, there's Tyndale. He's the reason that I can read this in my own language. Praise God for William Tyndale. And there he is in the middle of your city. Well, he's not there, but a likeness. And God has just been so kind to actually reveal his thoughts to men. And he's done it for us in this book. That's exactly what Paul is claiming right here. You can't know the the mind of God unless God discloses it. And look what he says next in verse 12. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. What an incredible statement. Paul is claiming knowledge, actual, true, real knowledge of the mysteries of God, the deep things of God, the things that God himself chooses to reveal, those truths which transcend every philosophy, every culture, every time, forever. If you've studied any Greek philosophy, you understand that every teacher of philosophy disagreed with all those teachers before him. 
So that if you're going to get a degree in ancient Greek philosophy, you have to study all of them because they're all different. They all disagree. No, none of them ever found the truth. They just made a living disagreeing with all the guys before them and coming up with something new. And that's been true throughout Western civilization and the study of philosophy. If any of you have studied uh, philosophy in undergraduate work, you understand what I'm talking about. You have to study all of these philosophers, and they all disagree with each other, and they write unbelievable amounts of books, and they create all kinds of new vocabulary, and you have to go and learn all of their vocabulary just to understand what they're saying, and all they're saying is nothing. It's a bunch of nothing. But their version of nothing is much more attractive than every previous version of nothing. Therefore, you must buy my books and listen to my lectures. That is the world of the world's wisdom seeking wisdom. It will never get anywhere. And here, God freely gave revelation. It's a gift. Just a kindness from God where He says, I want men to know what I think. And Paul happens to be the, the pen through which much of this came. He says, we have freely received these from the Lord. We have the work of the Holy Spirit in revelation. That is, giving the truth of God to the apostles and the prophets at the foundation of the church. In Ephesians 2.20, Paul calls the, the apostles and the New Testament prophets the foundation level of the church. You don't build a foundation at the 20th story. The foundation happens at the beginning. We had apostles and New Testament prophets at the beginning of the church in the first century. That is the foundation upon which church history has been built. You and I have their work in the documents of the New Testament. When Paul says, we have received them, he and his apostolic associates received them and wrote them down, and that is our New Testament. And so in verse 13, Paul says, these things that we received, we also speak. Paul's not free here to make up the material, to say extra things. He just says what he received. He's a herald. Again, the we here is not all Christians. You and I did not get direct revelation from God through the Spirit, verse 10. Nor did God give them to us directly, verse 12. Nor were you and I the ones who spoke to the Corinthians these things in verse 13. This section of Paul's argument is all about God's revelation in the first century on the lips of the apostles. But it's really important for us because as we read these things, these are the very words of God. When you read your Bible, God is speaking. Have you ever noticed when a New Testament author quotes the Old Testament and he'll say something like, as Isaiah says... Present tense. He doesn't say, Isaiah said a long time ago, but Isaiah currently speaks. Or the New Testament author might say something like, as the Holy Spirit says in Isaiah. In other words, the Holy Spirit is still speaking when you and I read these words in the New Testament today. This comes with clarity. This comes with authority. This comes with all the sufficiency grounded in God's revelation and Paul is pressing the spiritual nature of God's words, God's revelation, over and against the natural character of the wisdom of men. Paul did not deliver God's revelation in the packaging of human wisdom. Verse 13, not in words taught by human wisdom. Paul knew those words. He chose not to use those words. We teach them God's truths. In words taught by the Spirit, verse 13, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. The word for combining in my Bible is probably better understood as interpreting. We interpret or we deliver spiritual truths with spiritual words. We combine spirituals with spirituals. The idea is we convey spiritual realities with the words that the Holy Spirit gave. God truth, God's truth can only come through the Holy Spirit's words. We use God's content. We use God's method. These are God's truths, unadorned, undiminished, unapologetically heralded by faithful proclamation. God revealed His truth to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. God couched His truth in the words He chose through His Holy Spirit. And God, or Paul could do nothing else but stick to God's foolish message, proclaimed in a manner the world considered foolish. Foolish. 
You see, Paul was driven by obedience, not by results. He had not made a deal with the audience. He would not subject the truth of God to a line, what do I need to do today to get you into this worldview change? He's not going to compromise the message just to get the people to move. He's not going to compromise the methods in order to get the people to move. You see, if the audience, the critics, are allowed to dictate the terms by which they will accept or reject a message, then that audience will always be sovereign. The orator believes he's playing the crowd, and he knows that he is being played by the crowd. If his performance is not good, they will reject him. If they're not moved by him, they will let him know. But the gospel fundamentally calls sinners to stop being sovereign. The message of the cross of Christ and the methods of rhetoric are fundamentally at odds with one another. You can't package the gospel in a method that undermines the gospel. And Paul knew that. Now that leads us to a fourth and last commitment underpinning his preaching and his ministry. Paul expected a mixed response. Paul expected a mixed response to God's truth. We see this in verses 14 to 16. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. And you might think, well, then ministry is a failure. <laughs> if the natural man doesn't understand them, then I must be doing something wrong. Listen, when I was in undergraduate college, I heard a very famous preacher in America tell us that he, if you gave him long enough, could find the key to any human heart. Just give me long enough with this person and I will unlock the human heart so that they will believe the gospel and make a decision for Christ. How horrible <laughs> to think that you had the power to open a human heart or to raise the dead. My friends, only Jesus has that power. The Holy Spirit does regularly raise the dead, but he does so through the proclamation of God's word unadorned, not by human tricks, the gospel is compromised when we believe otherwise. And there should be no surprise here. Verse 14 says, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. James 3.15 says, the, the wisdom of man is not that which comes down from above, but it is earthly, natural, demonic. This word for natural here uh, is that which is merely the product of human capability. And human capability, by itself, unchanged, untransformed, will never accept and can never understand the things of the Spirit of God. And listen, we, we so desperately want people to believe the gospel. If you have unsaved family members, you pray for them, you plead with them, you talk to them, you send them cards and Bible verses, and you pray for them again. Have you ever been tempted to change the message. Whatever that hardest thing it is for them to believe about the gospel, have you been tempted to just, let me take that part away a little bit? And then you can make an easier step in to Christ. The church today wants to be accepted by natural man, and, and so the church does what she can to be appealing or entertaining or inoffensive skipping certain passages, not talking about certain topics, avoiding offensive language. But you and I need to be prepared to embrace the foolishness. Embrace the foolishness. Get accustomed to a mixed response. In verse 15, we see that he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. That is the spiritual man. It just means the born-again person has an ability to assess everything, both natural things and spiritual things. The reason the spiritual man can understand both worlds is because all of you were in that world. You were natural before you became spiritual. You already understood what the natural world is like and how natural man thinks. But now, you think the way God thinks. You can understand both. The natural man can only think like the natural man but you can assess all things. In verse 15, the, the spiritual man is assessed by no one. In other words, 
Paul and, and followers of Christ are not subject to the criticisms of the Corinthians or the culture around us who want fancy oratory, who want entertainment or tricks. Paul knows, and, and you and I know, where wisdom and power truly are. Tragically, at Corinth, we see in 1 Corinthians 3.1, that Paul had to speak to them not as mature. He says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. He says you're like brand new believers, still living and thinking like you used to think. Notice verse 16, how Paul closes this chapter. He says, who has known the mind of the Lord that the Lord would instruct him, or that he would instruct the Lord? but we possess the mind of Christ. What a staggering thing. In a quotation from Isaiah 40, verse 13, God's thoughts are way up here. Our thoughts are way down there. Who could ever know God's ways? And yet, what is Paul's claim? God has revealed them to us, and we've written them down, and you actually can know the mind of Christ. Not exhaustively, but truly, you can know God's thoughts, and we must. I want to illustrate this principle a little bit outside of Corinth. We've been sitting in Corinth for a long time this evening. I want to think about the second great awakening, that movement in America. Uh, the first great awakening was uh, Whitfield and the Wesleys and Jonathan Edwards and others. And many people were converted to Christ. Biblical preaching flourished. The second great awakening was a mixed bag. There, there were some actually coming to Christ during the Second Great Awakening. And then there were many others who just loved the idea of a revival and, and thought we can sort of schedule one and, and we can make it happen if we use these techniques. Charles Finney was the man who came up with what was called the New Measures. And he invented a lot of new techniques that are still used in popular evangelistic crusades to this day where he would compel people to make a decision for Christ. In fact, what he believed about converting to Christianity was that all that was needed was a decision. And so, whatever I needed to do oratorically to get somebody to make a decision for Christ was fair game. And so, he had something called the anxious bench. I thought about having one installed up here. It was a, a little short pew up front where he would call somebody at random out from the audience and make them sit there, and he would preach at them, sweating and yelling about hell and scaring them into a decision for Christ until they yielded. And, and I don't know how many people just said, okay, just to end the tirade. But he also invented things like the altar call where people came down an aisle and, and, and raised a hand or, or did some physical thing to demonstrate a newfound loyalty to Christ. You see, they, they had heard facts, their emotions had been toyed with, and then their wills were sealed and they made a decision. And tragically, at the end of his life, Charles Finney said, I think it has been my lot in life to produce tens of thousands of spurious conversions. What a tragedy. Looking back on his life, he realized so many people had made decisions for Christ and were never born again. And in America, the, the American Midwest became known as the burned over district. Because evangelists would sweep through towns and, and hold long, week-long evangelistic crusades and preach the gospel and get lots of decisions for Christ and move on to the next town. And people had not been truly converted. Churches had not been planted. Discipleship had not been done. And so the next time the gospel would come into the, these Midwestern towns, people could say, oh yes, we heard that message, we're good, move on. And they were sort of inoculated to the truth of the gospel. More recently, we have had the phenomenon of the seeker church. When I was in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, I, I was in one of the churches that uh, was uh, a trifecta of churches that invented the seeker model. 
One was Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago under Bill Hybels. The other was the Crystal Cathedral under Robert Schuler in Southern California. And the third, the friend in this sort of triangle of seeker church inventors was my pastor, Walt Kalistad in Arizona. And they began doing all kinds of interesting new techniques. They, they would play rock and roll music. They would use laser lights. They would open up the, the back doors of the church to open air uh, meetings. They tried to do everything they could to not let it look like church. My church started meeting in the local movie theater to attract people that would never feel comfortable going to a building like this. But they go to movies all the time. So we'll go to movies, we'll play music that they're comfortable with, we'll make them feel at home like they would on a Friday night. In fact, we'll just start doing services on Friday nights in the theater. And they rented out the local theater to do this. I'll never forget the, the pastor and his son, son sang uh, classic rock songs as special music during services. Why? Well, because that's the music the people we're trying to attract want to listen to. Why would we turn them away with, with old songs and words they don't understand? I mean, we want them to make a decision for Christ, right? Let's bring Christ to them by changing the forms and, and taking away those things which are just unnecessary hindrances. And the messaging was just happy. It was a pep talk. It was a, a way to get people come in and, and feel good about life and, and get a little more energy to walk into your next week. And sermons were no longer than 20 minutes. And you might be thinking right now, I wish that was true here tonight. But they would do anything that they could just to get people to sort of have positive ideas about Jesus. And eventually, maybe we'll get around to telling people that you're a dirty, rotten sinner in need of a Savior and you've offended a holy God and you're going to hell unless you repent and turn to Christ. When did that message ever happen? And it just became the model to preach this watered-down, shallow, feel-good message in an attempt to get the unbeliever in. And perhaps even more recently is this trend toward cultural awareness. You have to say those things that will make you as a presenter sound in touch with the wisdom of your hearers. Right? This is the sort of deal with the audience. If, if I don't connect with them, with what they're thinking about and what they feel they need, if I'm not connecting with what they want to hear and the messaging that they desire, well, they'll walk out. Really, the audience is sovereign. I'm playing them, but they're paying me to play them, and, and so I have to say what they want to say. If you're in an intellectual crowd, you, you have to use big words to impress them. A technological crowd, you have to use techie language. If you're an athletic crowd, you have to use sports analogies. If you're in a blue-collar crowd, you use crude humor or whatever. And whatever the trends of the day, whatever the hot-button issues are, those are the things you must talk about. Environmentalism. In America, it is woke Christianity. That's what you must talk about. Or the Me Too movement and, and be sensitive to all the things that that movement is bringing about. In our day, you have to speak about the, the language of brokenness and the language of abuse and, and the language of privilege. In fact, you cannot be a public persona in America today if you're not tuned in to those latest trends of acceptable vocabulary. People are getting fired from prominent positions left and right because of things they said 20 years ago that became unattractive last week. Newscasters, sportscasters, teachers, singers, actors, politicians, all in the last month have been fired for missteps and miscues. You can't even be a non-speaking public person if you don't engage in the right kinds of messaging. And so now people pay all kinds of money to have people coach them on what they should say and how they should say it so as not to offend in order to keep an audience. You seek out the psychological categories of the felt needs of your audience. You, you learn the tools of persuasion applied to the task of preaching Jesus. I think this is one of the root causes of the multi-site, high production value, celebrity staffed ministries of our day. Why, well, you, you have to get the things that attract the unbelievers. You can't trust the gospel just spoken. You, you can't trust the Word of God to actually change lives. You, the, the gospel needs help. And the Word of God needs some help. 
Now, make no mistake, Paul was interested in persuasion. Persuasion is not the problem. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.11, we persuade men. And in 2 Corinthians 5.20 and 21, he says, we are ambassadors and we beg you on behalf of God, be reconciled to Him. Paul wanted people to know Christ. But he would not succumb to human tricks to get people merely to make a decision. He knew where the power was. The Holy Spirit had to make someone alive by new birth. There are some implications for us, I think, here this evening. You parents, I I think you know the difference between results-driven and obedience-driven parenting. Right? If your kids are giving you a difficult time, there are things you can do. There are things you can say. There's a tone of voice you can have. There's a look on your face that you can produce that will get immediate results. But if you sin in the process, uh, that does not honor God and it does not help your children. The idea in parenting is to be obedience-driven. In other words, I don't want to sin. I want to glorify God in how I parent my children. It is possible to discipline your parent, your your discipline your parents, discipline your children, and train them in the truth of God's word and teach them right for wrong and, and bring about the appropriate consequences for those things without sinning. But man, there are some shortcuts you can take if you're just willing to sin. (laughs) And we ought not do that. There are implications for us in regards to personal evangelism. When we proclaim the gospel, we are the herald, not the politician, not the car salesman. Faithful evangelism, when you are proclaiming Christ, honors God because it worships Jesus. Every time you preach the gospel, you are declaring before the world, my Savior is better than life. He's better than everything and you must know Him. And that honors God no matter how anybody responds. It doesn't matter what the results are in a human sense. And you think about what kind of preaching you want to hear, what kind of preaching you hold your pastors accountable to. Does he give the tearjerker story and the well-placed humor? Are, are there images on the screen? Does the music stir my soul and, and set me in just the right frame of mind where, where the pastor can say and, and move my emotions? Does he use the right tone and gestures? Does he slow down in the right ways and talk quietly? And does he use all of those tricks, all of those things designed to evoke a decision The goal of the preacher ought to be clarity, not cleverness. Just simple clarity. Can, can I explain God's word to God's people and trust God to do the work? In our town, we're infatuated with celebrity appearances. All along the, the, the motorways, there are billboards and signs that advertise churches with the latest star athlete, the latest public speaker, uh, the what was the one recently from the the Bachelor, the television show, and the Bachelor was going to come speak at the church to draw a crowd. It is so liberating to recognize that you don't have to do those things, Christian. You don't have to be an expert in oratory to preach the gospel. Do you know what you get to do? Just tell someone what the Lord has done for you, and you don't have to word it just right. That's not where the power is. You just boldly proclaim what God has done. You're just a herald. Augustine said, after he got saved, he wrote this in his confessions, I studied the art of eloquence at an impressionable age, and it was my ambition to be a good speaker for the unhallowed and inane purpose of gratifying human vanity. It's a remarkable admission. And you may know that Augustine's conversion was remarkable. His mother, Monica, had prayed for him for 30 years. And he was really smart. He was really accomplished. He had the world by its tail. And you would think, man, who could ever share the gospel with a guy like Augustine? A guy at the top of the world. Who could impress him enough to convince him to yield to Christ? And do you know what it was? It was a child singing a little song in an alleyway, and he happened to overhear it. We sing with our kids at night, the B-I-B-L-E. 
Yes, that's the book for me. It was a little ditty like that. And the words went something like, take up the book and read. And he was convicted, pierced to the heart. He went home and he read Romans, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And he was instantly saved. That's where the power is. I'll close with Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says, let us be careful that in our desire to be considered intellectually respectable, we do not expose ourselves to infections which can do us grievous harm in a spiritual sense. If you are out for intellectual respectability, you will soon get into trouble in your faith. Believe the message, trust it utterly, absolutely, and look to the Holy Spirit of God to open the blind eyes and to give understanding to the spiritually dead. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. So kind to us to put it in our language. So kind to reveal your mind to us, your ways to us. We pray to be faithful heralds of these things. Let us not get infatuated with impressing the world around us. But let us be enamored by your glory. Let us fear you. And until you return or take us home, let us unashamedly proclaim this glorious message of a crucified Christ. And we pray it in his name.